Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you once again for joining our research morning call on the 28th of June 2021. Um, today will, will be rather light uh, content. Uh, first up, we have um, Cam, uh, Kappa Corporation, um, and then followed by Sam Corp Marine um, by Terence, and then followed by some uh, SG Technicals um, on the STI Outlook, Nano Firm, Top Glove, and DBS Group Holding. Lastly, we have our head of research, um, Paul Chiu, to share about the Singapore Weekly. So without further ado, I'll pass my time to Terence, uh, where you will share about um, the Capital Corporation. Uh, Terence, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Weiren. Thanks. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Capital announced the signing of two MOUs last week with regards to its MO o and m unit. So to recap, uh, the first MOU that uh, Keppel signed with Samcom Marine is a non-binding MOU for exclusive negotiations on combining the Keppel o &M unit and Samcom Marine. They envisage to enter into a 50-50 joint venture uh, at, the, at the end of the negotiations. For the second MOU that Keppel signed, uh, they signed a non-binding MOU with Kyanite Investment Holdings, a wholly owned investment subsidiary of Tamasic. So, so what they intend to do with, the, with this second MOU is to sell their O&M uh, legacy unit to, uh, for their, their completed and uncompleted rigs and associated receivables to a separate asset company. So all the, all the uh, legacy rigs, they were, they, were, they were actually inject into this company. Uh, we, we, they, we call it Asset Co. So this Asset Co would be a majority owned by external investors. So the, the, the details is below. So in, in, for this Asset Co, they, they aim to hold no, not more than a 20% stake in Asset Co. So the rest of the 80% uh, for, will be held by external investors, which Kyanite will, will procure uh, to hold this, this balance 80%. So for us, in terms of the, the key takeaways for these this two MOUs that, that Capital signed, to, 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 to be sure the MOUs, these two MOUs that Capital signed is non-definitive uh, at this moment, not definitive at this moment. So there's no there's no deal yet, but we for us we we see this as a positive uh, step because this is another step towards a final resolution of Capo O and M. So for some of uh, y'all who have been following Capo, y'all will know uh, at the beginning of the year when when Capo announced out their Vision Twenty Thirty plans, they really uh, they, what they did was they split up the Capo O and M into three units: Rico, Development Co, and uh, Asset Co. So what they, they with, with this this latest move, we see this as yet another step towards reaching a final resolution of Capo O and M. So Capo and M has for us, we see Capo and M the in terms of the resolution, it has always been an overhang on the stock. So now with this uh, final resolution or or path towards the final resolution, we believe there will be a potential re-rating. Uh, on the capital group on, the, on this clearer path la, towards their O&M uh, business. The second positive that we see for this two MOU side is the capital is expected to receive a cash consideration of up to $500 million uh, and also a solution for their, their stranded rigs. La. Uh, the capital shareholders can, will also have exposure to synergies and opportunities with the merge entity. So we'll, we'll talk more about the merge entity uh, slightly later, but we, when, they, when they merge these two, two entities together, which we, we see also as a long time in coming, should have happened uh, much earlier already, but sometimes better late than never. So when they merge these two, they, they will be able to benefit from the uh, a, a larger entity la, that, that, that will be able to to benefit from some synergies as well. So what Keppel will do is they will distribute to shareholders all these merge entity shares la, that it receives by way of a distribution species. So they, they got no uh they don't have the exchange ratio yet and the, the manner in which they will they will do this is also not decided yet because again no no agreement has been reached. But uh, they intend to to arrive at this announcement by the fourth quarter of 2021. And that's also the, the long stop date for this uh, transaction and the MOU. But what, what, what Keppel said in the announcement is that if if they cannot reach an uh, agreement or, or they, they, they haven't finalized out the transaction details, by fourth quarter, they will they will extend it. So assuming all things fall in place, they will they will they will complete the transaction by fourth quarter 2021 and the Reach, sorry, they will reach a definitive agreement by fourth quarter 2021 and they will finish 
the transaction by either first quarter or second quarter of 2022. So our recommendation is we maintain our buy recommendation on Capital with a higher uh, sum of the parts target price of $6.20 from $6.12 previously. So we believe the better clarity uh, on its o &M division should narrow the division's discount to its book value. So what, what we did is we kept, we kept our valuation of the rest of his units the same, but we raised the value of his o &M division. So previously, our valuation of the o &M division is about 0 0.6 times. Uh. Now we raised it to 0 0.7 times. Still, still a, 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 a substantial discount to his book value. But with, with this, this, this uh, raise, our target price is now $6.20. So that's all from, for, for Keppel Corporation. We now move on to our next slide on Samcorp Marine. So Samcorp Marine also concurrently announced their move to, 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 to they, they also announced the uh, two, two corporations that they will be embarking on. The first is to, to do a rights issue. So you can see a summary of the, the key terms of the renounceable, renounceable underwritten rights issue. So also take note that this is a film on the ground. We, just, we, we don't cover the, the counter. La. But we just, we just provide some of our, our, our thoughts when we attend the, 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 the Sam Corp Marine briefing. So the, the rights will be a three rights share for every two existing shares held. Uh, they, they, they are going to raise approximately $1.5 billion from this, this rights issue. The rights, the, the rights price is about eight cents per right share. So you can see the pricing consideration. The, the important thing is the, the third uh, based on the last transaction transacted price that they, they announced. So the uh, post uh, rights issue, the, the, the third is about 12 cents for. Uh, the rights is also fully underwritten by Thomastic and DBS in 67% 33% proportions respectively. So the use of the proceeds here is, this one is important because they, what they, they intend to use is for working capital and general corporate purposes with, with including debt servicing. We'll talk about more about this slightly later. But importantly, the, the one, one, one thing that they, they stress during the meeting is no part of this $1.5 billion uh, to be raised will be payable to Keppel with respect to the merger. So the, you, you, like if for your, those who remember, the Keppel is expected to receive $500 million from the o &M business. So this $1.5 billion that they are planning to raise is not intended to fund the $500 million that they raised. So for us, our interpretation of this is, uh, the, that, that means that if Samcom Marine were to really to, if the transaction were to take place, then what Samcom Marine will have to do then is that they may have to raise further debt. Lah, because I don't think they will go back to the shareholders for another round of fundraising. Really. So they will have to, what, what they have to do is they have to, to raise uh, 500 million to, to pay capital lah, if, if the merger were to take place. Yeah, so in our next slide, uh, these are some of the, the, the key dates la, for the, the EGM shareholder approval. And, uh, so the, this will be an ordinary resolution to approve the rights issue. So uh, this, the, the announcement of the, the rights issue is on the 24th of June. They will dispatch the EGM circular. So the EGM is expected to, to be held on the, uh, the August of 2021. And then they target to complete the listing and trading of the new rights share uh, by the third quarter of 2021. And also, if, if you look at the dates here, when they, by the time they list the new, new right shares in third quarter of 2021, they, they hope to, to wrap up the, conclude, the, the merger of Keppel in the fourth quarter la, of 2021. So, so there, there's this timeline that they, they plan. La. So Star Tree, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Masik, has also provided an undertaking to vote in favor of the resolution. They only need a simple majority, 50%. So it's a bit unclear now if they, they will waive this one, but what they're saying is that they already will vote for this. So with, with the Masik already owning about 40 over percent, more likely that it, it will pass. Yeah, Nick, next slide. So some of the, the transaction rationale also, uh, and also we on, on the left-hand side, we provided a summary of some of the uh, key financials that will happen after the, the issuance of the rights. So the, of, they say this issuance of the rights will, will ensure sufficient liquidity to meet the near-term working capital needs to ride out the prolonged downturn. So you can see 
after the rights issuance, they expect the pro forma net, net gearing to go down from 0 0.75 times to 0 0.25 times. The net tangible assets also will increase from 3.4 billion to 4.9. Uh, importantly, the cash balance after the rights issuance will push uh, San Marine's uh, total cash from 800 million to 2.3 billion. This is pro forma, means, means uh, based on the 31st December 2020, assuming the transaction had taken place then. The, the 1.5 billion to be raised is meant to fulfill existing commitments and win new projects. So they have about $1.89 billion in order book. And they will, they will use that money also to actively tender for projects in the renewable energy, gas solutions and process solution segments. And also to accelerate the strategic pivot into high growth renewable and clean energy segments, which is nothing new. Lah. But, but this, this one will, will further their ambition to, to, into these new areas. So uh, in our last slide on San Marine, the just just uh, this this is this this is a slide on uh, the potential combination overview of the Keppel, how how both Keppel and San Marine envisage the 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 merger of the entity units to look like. Uh, so the what they will do is Keppel O and M uh, like will pump in all the existing assets and operations in Keppel O and M, excluding certain assets. So these assets. Um, that they will not include is the uncompleted rigs, some of these associated receivables and the, some other assets la, la, uh, which will be excluded. So this, all these uh, uncompleted rigs, all these associated receivables will actually be pumped into the asset core. Uh, then for San Marine, they will, they will, it's the entire assets and operations la, that they will inject in, into this, this entity. Uh, long stop date is fourth quarter, uh, could be extended. And then a potential combination of completion rather of the entire transaction is expected in the first quarter or second quarter of 2022. So that's all for me on uh, Sam Corp Marine. I'll now hand over the time to Wei Ren. All right, thank you, Darren, um, for, for your sharing. Okay, so um, right now I go through the STI uh, index, so some of the update. So the last time I shared was like two webinars ago. So first of all, um, some update on the STI. So, uh, with the looming of the um, uh, of the rebound of the uh, support zone highlighted around at three zero five four, um, the up re rebound was kept uh below the resistance zone, and then the sell down was like in in the limbo, uh, with with a sl slowing down of momentum. Neither neither the bull or the bear are, are going forward. Um, in, in this retrospect, so hence, um, uh, there are three. Um, there are three scenarios that I'll, first, I'll play out. Now, first of all, you can see that there's a pattern uh, forming and also a diamond pattern um, that is forming as well, uh, like the like the, the EOB and OCDC. All right, so uh, there's a track of breaking below the support zone and go below 3,000 and then find a support at 2009 region uh, for rebound. And then if this happened, it will be forming as a second scenario that will be a flag um forming and then therefore there's a rebound back to test a uh, resistance zone two uh another thing is um if today the futures in the dow did well then uh, by end of uh, uh, by the london session then there's a possibility that there will be a, a breakthrough um uh, this week um uh, above resistance zone one and then there will be a resistance zone two uh going forward so the scenario three is uh price directly has a breakdown from a true way pattern um, like what scenario two is, uh, there'll be a flag and then uh, it goes up to two down eight. Uh, there's a deeper retracement and then price is going to break up uh, further on the upside. All right. So for the uh, STI on the daily index, uh, the Ichimoku has shown that um, price is currently ranging. There's not much signal going forward. Um, the the twenty six days and fifty two days are plotted forward. Senku span A and B uh, remain flat and thinly in the volatility. So hence, um, there is a possibility that uh, price will continue to test uh, in the intraday. Uh, will continue goes down and test the support zone one at three zero one seven to three zero five nine. Uh, going forward, um, this also played out in the previous weekly chart that I shared that this one will be uh, enlarged into a three-way pattern down on the outside. Um, if you look at a larger trend, um, price has really formed a lower low, lower high, and lower low. Um, and price is still within a range itself. Um, price um, fails to break 3002. 
uh, rejects uh, 3002 and then therefore um, right now is much more of a range market right now that is have a propensity to trend lower. All right, so I move on to nano film technology. So longer top wave uh, is the primary uh, is the primary wave. So we have the oh, no, sorry intermediate phase. So we have the intermediate phase of wave one completed. These are all minor phase. So uh, we have the complex cor corrective A, B, C. Uh, right now there is a, there's a concern, all right, whether that whether this is a wave one or wave X. Um, should this support term resistance zone at four point nine seven to five point one zero? It's being broken, all right. So it is being support, and then um, price have a very strong bullish upside reversal, and then then he has a propensity to um. It, Break target resistance zone. What uh, reason is because the this target resistance zone has been tested uh one two uh three and then consolidation here. So hence uh this three wave down may be signal a deep retracement for wave two. All right over here uh before rebound. So if this support zone resistance zone is broken, then we are likely to find the support zone two or support zone three for the larger W X Y uh double three or triple three corrective flat uh going forward. All right. So uh, right now I'm sharing about top glove. Um, top glove is a is a classic triple three. Um, price has an inside bar on last Friday, so there's there's a propensity to break down lower to test one point two five region uh, support zone. Um, this support zone is very crucial. It it, it decides whether it make or break uh, or there's a there's a long term upside. So uh, another thing looking forward. Um, into the future, if if this is a successful rebound, that's another crucial factor is that uh, long term wise, you need to close and break above two two dollars for the period of um around two months to sustain that this is the start of a explosive wave three. So this is wave one, this is wave three, uh going forward. So if this two dollar is not sustainable, then therefore uh the whole whole downside trend. And all this will be into a, a bearish impulsive instead of a bullish impulse uh, wave count. So uh, in 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 Alice's way of saying is that the Alice wave count, all right, for for top glove and for other gloves, uh, company like Medtech and uh, Riverstone or UG, there there is a propensity that um the one two three four five will be in bearish wave. Okay, so next one uh, I'll share about quickly I'll share about DBS. So DBS in a larger time frame, uh, this is a weekly time frame. Uh, you can see that the primary phase, uh, one, two, three, four, five, extended week three has been completed in 2015 to 2018. Uh, from 2018 to 2020 is actually uh in the WXY uh, corrective um, um channel, or you can say it's a double three, uh, in the, in in a larger retrospect. All right, so. Whereas uh, right now, uh, since it haven't has not even break the thirty one dollars uh, and eighty five cents, so hence um, this A B C um, there is still a threat. Although that's uh, right now that I'm shifting towards a uh, one and two. So one two. So this uh, this uh, wave three potential wave three target uh, at thirty dollars and sixty six cents has been met. So uh, we are facing a sub wave uh, wave four. So it will be A, B or C over here as support zone two, uh, maximum play. So if this breaks, then this, this support zone two at 24 and 25 is broken, then A, B, C will likely be a, uh, there'll be a W, X, Y, and then there's a trip, uh, there's an X, X, and then uh, there's a Z wave at around $20 or even lower and $13 and like four cents uh, going forward. So this $31, it, um, it, it must be broken. So yeah, okay. So in, in the daily chart, it shows a price broken out of the uh, falling wedge already. So hence there's a propensity to, to reverse and then trend lower to find the support at $28 or even lower at 27.47 uh, support zone. All right, so uh, Ichimoku is showing some sort of flattish. Uh, there may be a propensity to trend up higher uh, but price is likely to cap at thirty dollar region around here. All right, so DBS in the long run, uh, in the shorter run, uh, we are facing some some sort of a slight minor correction going forward. Um, uh, also you can see that this ascending side, uh, since March has been on the on the slow momentum as compared to 
uh, recent in the you know, recent day. All right. Okay. So um, next one is Paul. Uh, next one, I'll pass my time to Paul uh, for the Singapore Weekly. Thank you. Paul, to you. Thanks, Baron. Uh, next slide. Okay, I'll just move on to uh, an, a quick update on, on the Singapore macro. Uh, the industrial production numbers for Singapore came up. Uh, the numbers was, was a huge number. I mean, the jump was 33% uh, to a record level. Obviously, you're comparing with a pandemic hit uh, economy. Uh, that, that's why the base effect was there. The, a year ago, the, our production numbers was, was actually down 6%. But even if you remove this and you compare to 2019, there's still a huge rise of 26%. Uh, electronics for May was also very strong, about 24. So, so manufacturing and industrial activity in Singapore is still, is, is still very strong and accelerating in a way. Uh, in terms of the news from the US, uh, nothing much, but in terms of just an interesting commentary, uh, uh, what we're getting is a, a bit of acknowledgement right now that uh, inflation is, is, is uh, rising far higher than expectations. I think even Yellen mentioned that they are expecting inflation to be below 5%. 5% is a huge number. Uh, so a lot, I think what it means, at least from my perspective, is that uh, inflation is, is getting more and more, uh, it's, it's accelerating and also much higher than expected. And uh, in a way, I guess it's going to be negative for bonds if there'll be one impact to it. Uh, there was also the inflation numbers, uh, it was accelerating. And it's actually the largest rise in 30 years. But again, uh, like we, likely the market will consider this, uh, a lot of it due to base effect and reopening. But as we move to you know, Ju Ju July, August, and so forth, that's where the base effect is removed. And then you will, then it's, very, it's harder to say that this is due to base effect and it's not really something that's happening within the economy. Uh, I'll discuss later some of the events that we attended, the Del Monte Pacific uh, re results briefing and also the, the province webinar and viral hub. Uh, in terms of our tactical views, uh, we are we still positive on the market and I think uh, what we like is to position for some of the deep uh, reopening plays. I, I think you we all heard on Friday the commentary right now by even the, the PM and also by the authorities that they're going to manage the pandemic in Singapore at least uh, like a common flu. And so once we get that, the, that I don't know, 70, 75 percent vaccination, I'm, I guess it's probably September, October, they're going to ease border restrictions and they're going to allow more community events. Uh, another pertinent point is the narrative will also change. I think they're going to be focused on uh, hospitalized cases, not the daily cases. So they may not even report the daily cases. I, I, I guess if you're going to, re if this is going to be like a flu, then uh, you won't report the daily community case, but you're going to just report uh, cases that have been hospitalized and then maybe need ICU and so forth. So the whole narrative is going to change. And, and I, I think the, it's very likely, of course, depending on variants and you know, the ability of vaccines, that uh, all the lockdowns will be way, way behind us. Uh, the other thing, uh, the next is of course some of the events that's happening, uh, and then for the poems webinar uh, for today, uh, for this week uh, we have uh, tomorrow actually uh, we have SPH, uh, and also on Friday we have MM2 Asia, uh, so, so uh, feel free to register for it. Uh, MM2 Asia we are a bit late in putting it on poems, so hope, uh, hopefully you have time just uh, sign up for that. Uh, the rest is still pending, uh, uh, pending. Uh, poems load, load, loading and also we have a uh, Singapore third quarter strategy for those who are free to attend. Uh, next slide. Yeah, okay, okay. Anyway, this is just, I just wanted to get a sense of uh, if we were to do a, a reopening trade or reopening play, uh, these are the stocks that have been the, the most affected. Uh, of course, everyone's affected. I mean, no one is, is kind of immune to it uh, apart from. Uh, uh, maybe, but um, if you just look at the table, just to help you read. So, uh, of course, the, on the left is the company name, then PSR, this is our, our recommendation. So, the pre-COVID performance is, how is the stock performance from uh, December, uh, 31st December, which is, you know, uh, we tag it as before the pandemic and the current share price now. So, you can see these are the stocks that have been the worst hit. And on paper, at least if everything goes back to the norm, I mean, at least most of it, then you see that the stocks that have been worst hit could be the ones that that will benefit the most. Um, the, uh, that is why, you know, when you see stocks like Comfort and also Escort, they are in our model portfolio. 
and, and part of the reason is just that we are positioning ourselves for the reopening. And, and I, I, again, all, all this is likelihood there will be a, a roadmap going to be announced. Uh, and of course, everything depends on the number of vaccines and also the, the kind of variants that we're getting. But these are the stocks that have been overseed and we think these are the ones that could rally if the reopening occurs as expected. And, and next slide. Uh, okay, our, our usual update, uh, the daily cases, global cases are still declining, but a, a bit of a slower pace. Uh, next slide. Um, in Singapore, I won't run through this. I think the community case is still sideways. It's still high. I think last week was 15 on average per day. Now it's about 13. Uh, and I think the authorities also mentioned that they expect the daily cases to rise as we you know recently opening open up for more, they call it high-risk activities, which is like dining. Uh, next, next slide. Okay, I, I'll move on to Del, Del Monte, uh, the, the briefing. Uh, there's a lot of words here, but let me just run through uh, roughly. So, so Del Monte, as you know, they are a consumer company. So they sell all these products, uh, juice, uh, fruits, and so forth. So it, a, a bit of history uh, for those who can't recall. So Del Monte Pacific was entirely focused on Philippines uh, and also uh, yeah, Asia. Uh, but what happened was in 2014, they made this big acquisition, uh, I think US uh, 1.7, I think well, US 1.7 billion. And they, they were really selling this huge, huge company, which is a canned food maker in the US. And then they had to take on a lot of debt. So since 2014, they've been doing this very painful restructuring. And I think uh, right now the restructuring is more or less over and we are beginning to see the benefits of it. So, so uh, right now, uh, so what happened in the results is revenue was only up 2% for FY April 21, but the profit doubled. Um, the, the pet me from 63, uh, sorry, the, the pet me, um, actually they were loss making, sorry, and then they, they, it jumped to 63 million, uh, but it, the actual number is 43 million uh, if you, because there's some preference shares dividend, so you take that out. So the stock right now is trading about 13 times PE. Uh, what happened is mainly the US. Uh, so the US turned around in FY21, they were making a loss of 100 million, and then now they made a, a profit of 15 million. Uh, 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 some of the reasons is that they, they used to have, I think, 12 factories, so they closed almost half of their factories, took out a lot of costs. Uh, I'll explain later. Uh, but just as a reminder, in the Americas or the US, their main products are canned beans, like you know what you see in the picture here the, on the right. You know, so when they, you know, when a typical family, maybe when they eat, I don't know, a steak or or, you know, or chicken or whatsoever, they will just serve it with you no know, canned vegetables and so forth. So they are the number one operate uh, canned beans and uh, canned veggie uh, seller in the US. Uh, they're also into canned fruits, you know, peaches and uh, pineapples and also fruit cups. So that that's the main products in the Americas. In, in the U, in in Asia Pacific, uh, is mainly juice and China is mainly the fresh uh, fresh pineapple. So that is doing well in China. They're the number one seller of fresh pineapples. And of course, selling fresh pineapples is a huge margin because you don't have to do anything. You just transport it and that's it. Uh, the picture's on your far right. So in terms of the outlook, uh, it looks positive for them. I, I think the, the turnaround is, under, uh, is underway and for a consumer company, 13 times look cheap. But, but there is a caveat, of course. Uh, in terms of the outlook, uh, the, the turnaround in, in the US was, you know, they closed seven factories. Uh, to five, and then they had a lot of new product innovations. The new management came in, they were more operationally focused. So they came out with fruit cups and a, a lot of other products uh, that they were introduced in the US. Uh, the other thing that they're going to do is to penetrate more food service. So I guess maybe McDonald's, you have uh, pineapple juice next time. Uh, and then what happened was they also exited a lot of those uh, low margin private labels. I mean, you know, for instance, maybe if you produce for Walmart, Obviously, Mama is going to squeeze you and then you, you get very low margins because they're not selling your own brand. And also, they participate for a lot of those government tenders. You know, sometimes some of these tenders are for canned food to, you know, to help the poor and so forth. So those are so very low margins. Uh, the other thing that is positive is that, so they're exiting all those business. The other thing is that they also raise prices uh, for, uh, for their canned veggie uh, 7 to 10%. So that is, I guess, one way to, to hedge against inflation. Uh, the other, so for, for Philippines, they're also doing well. Uh, Philippines has always been their stronghold. They're the number one player there. So what is happening right now is that they're expanding their distribution points. 
Uh, I think we were a bit surprised. I think you already so many years in Philippines. Uh, so what they said was that they are, they want to match like Unilever and PNG's distribution points. So I guess that made a, a sense. Uh, the other thing is that they're also creating a new product line, so uh, which is a selling dairy products, uh, dairy yogurt. So that's also another positive for them. So in China, they will just focus on the, the fresh pineapple and expand. Uh, the other thing is that uh, they, they're undergoing an IPO in Philippines. So that will help pay the preference shares and reduce that 20 million uh, dividend and, and uh, dividend to preference shareholders. Uh, but if you take out the part, so probably could uh, raise uh, you know, earnings per share. Uh, uh, just a rough guess is probably maybe 10 or high single digit to maybe 10% increase by doing this IPO. So you get that lift in earnings. Uh, and the caveat I mentioned was because they, they are still, to, when they acquired the US, uh, like we mentioned, they acquired this huge thing, this huge company, then they had to take on debt. So the net debt is huge. So you can consider the net debt is 1.2 billion and you look at the market cap of 700. So that is the caveat. The caveat is the huge debt load. And the caveat is also because they got this 100 million yearly interest expense. But at the same time, if the turnaround happens, you will get this extra lift to earnings. Because once the, the, the cash flow improves, the turnaround happens, they're going to bring down their interest expense and that will also be another driver to earnings. So you get this extra lift to earnings, not only operationally, but also from the interest expense. If the turnaround happens, uh, uh, it's a non-rated. Uh, next slide. Okay, th this is my, my last slide. Uh, so this will be on the Enviro Hub briefing uh, for our poems webinar. Uh, this is just to update those who could not attend. So, so this company has four business. They do e-waste, uh, rubber glove, piling, and property. So uh, they're going to re uh, sell off the property and the piling and focus on e-waste and rubber gloves. Uh, so the, for rubber gloves, what happened was they acquired a 25% stake in a EPO-based uh, glove maker. And then in 21 May, uh, 21st May, they announced another 75% pending acquisition for cash and shares. Uh, and they comes with a profit guarantee. And they're going to ramp uh, their, uh, their uh, uh, sorry, uh, and the, the, this is a small glove maker. I think they're making about 450 to 500. Just to give you some context, I think uh, UG is, is producing, I think, uh, hitting almost 4 billion right now. Uh, so the second thing is they are, what they do is they recycle e waste. So e waste is you now the uh, multinationals will send their you know, handphones or laptops or whatsoever uh, to them to recycle. And from the picture on the right, uh, again, not, uh, just for your info, I know not everybody wants to know about this, but what they do is that uh, the model, how you, the recycling model is that they will buy the electronics from the multinational. Uh, of course, how, how does the multinational price the, the product is they were based on their own assessment of the precious content inside, it could be gold, silver, and then they'll sell it to EnviroHub. Then EnviroHub will extract it and then sell the precious metal and then the base metal you can see the, the, the chart on the right and then the whatever scrap is, is also sold, the, the scrap metal and, and, and so forth. So in terms of the outlook, um, again, we have no rating and no coverage, but uh, they were going to complete the acquisition so that will boost earnings and then uh, they're going to expand production in the rubber glove to 1.4 billion by end 21. Uh, disposed properties piling and they're going to move more into healthcare products. And in terms of the e-waste, e-waste wasn't very profitable for them. I think like 1 million and so forth. So what they just mentioned is that the multinationals with the new uh, uh, US administration focus on, on the environment and so forth. I think there's a bit of a bigger drive by the multinationals to, to, to increase their recycling efforts. I guess that, that's the commentary that was made for them. Again, uh, uh, and there's only like five of such companies. Okay. Um, if that's it for me. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to type it under the Q&A box. Uh, we, we'll just wait for one minute uh, because, uh, again, apologies to everyone, there is no 11.15 uh, uh, session uh, due to some scheduling uh, reasons. Uh, yeah. But we will record this and we will upload this on, on YouTube. Okay, uh, if, if there's no, no, no questions, uh, thank you everyone for, for attending and hope to see you next week. And the 11.15 session will resume as, norm as per normal next week. Thank you everybody.